All right. Uh, anyone can everyone hear me? All right. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, testing only in production, or rather, not testing only in production. Um, okay. I'm Andreas Nilsson. I work as a UX designer at Red Hat. Uh, in the past, I've been involved in GNOME. Uh, I used to work for Mozilla for a while, and then I've been at Red Hat for the last five years. Um, working on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, and more specifically on uh, uh, web console for Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, with the codename Cockpit, uh, which is also uh, which is an administration uh, UI for administrators. Um, more specifically, uh, people who are new to uh, Linux, uh, and uh, yeah. All right, uh, so on the 13th of January uh, this year, uh, the citizen of the state of, of uh, Hawaii woke up to this message in their phone uh, that there was an incoming uh, missile attack. Uh, the weeks before that, uh, the whole tone between uh, North Korea and the United States had really gone badly. So uh, it was not a, a big stretch to think that this would be a nuclear missile attack. Uh, so people got very afraid, they got panicked. Uh, you know, people who were on their way to work, they, they uh, ran to seek uh, shelter in tunnels. Uh, people tried to call their loved ones to say, okay, this is it, you know, we had a good time, but I guess this is it. Um, and, you know, people got very panicked in general. The 911 number was unavailable because the, the phone lines were so overwhelmed. Uh, but it turned out uh, it was actually only a false alarm. Um, and people got to know this like 30 minutes later. Um, they got this message. Um, and uh, the whole reason why, why this happened was uh, because it was later discovered it was a human error. The, the operator of the system, so the missile alert system in Hawaii, every month they need to, to do a dry run of it. Uh, but it's not supposed to go out to the general public. Uh, but the operator had mistakenly pressed the wrong button in the UI. Uh, that looked like this. So it wasn't actually a human error, it was more of a design error. So what we have here is a couple of different options, and they're in this kind of drop-down. This is not the actual UI, this is like some approximate approximation of the UI, because uh, I think like the actual UI is like secret or something, for military reasons. Um, the operator was supposed to hit the monthly test but accidentally hit the, 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 the real option, which is right right under it, which is Pacom, which triggers the whole alarm for the whole island, right, of Hawaii. Uh, there's also an option for false alarm, but this was added only later, uh, after the, the whole uh, missile alert. Um, all right. Um, and so one way of looking at design is that it's a rendering of intent uh, in the way that everything is actually designed, even if it's not designed well, it's still designed by someone, it's created by someone, someone had an intent. In the case of this missile alert UI, the person who did it didn't intend for it to be misused in that way so that the operator would hit the wrong button in the UI, uh, but this happened anyway. Um, but they only found out once the system was in production. Um, so, even, even if you're not developing missile alert warning systems, you, you still have the issue of, of uh, people using it wrongly and then blaming themselves or that they get fired over a mistake they make like this. Um, and the only way to, to assure that this doesn't happen is that you test it, you test the design before it ends up in production. But, and, and this you can do with the usability test, um, but usually um, 
when, when you, you think, oh, we need to do usability tests, but then you have a lot of misconceptions, a lot of fears um, of, of doing it wrong. And so the first fear the, is that the people feel like, oh, they're very big and it's very complicated to do it. I need a very expensive uh, and, and big setup. I would need something like this that is a usability lab. Uh, this is uh, from Oracle. Um, I think the photo is from 2007. It's by Eugene Kim. Uh, and it's a whole setup here, right? In the back there, you have the person actually using the computer. And then you have a person next to them that's moderating the test. And then you have this whole studio that is the second room uh, uh, next to it. And, and, you, they, you, and back in the day, you really needed this big setup because you needed to record the audio, you needed to record the video. Uh, if you wanted the whole development team to observe the test without intimidating the, the participant too much, you had to put them in this separate room and then you had to have this two-way mirror so the participant in there, they only see a mirror, right? Like in a crime show. Um, but these days, all you need is a laptop, actually. And I'll get back to this in a bit. Um, all right. The second fear or misconception that people have is that you need to be a researcher to conduct a test like this. Um, but uh, you actually don't. Like, anyone can do it. It's not that hard. Um, and say you don't have a researcher in your team, you can still do it because it needs to be done. Uh, if you have a researcher, that's awesome. Then you should use that person. They will be able to help you. But if you don't, you can still do it. Um, because it doesn't need to be that exact. It's not, you know, it's not scientific research where you need to make sure that everything is very careful. Uh, you know, and, and you need to, to run it very carefully and not uh, mess with the data in a sense. But if you do a usability test, it's applied research. You can you borrow things from um, scientific research, some, some uh, methods, um, but you don't need to be as careful. So for example, one, one test that we did at work was that we, we were implementing software updates of the operating system in our UI. Uh, and then we had six people in total that were supposed to test it over uh, the course of a day. So we had three people in the morning um, and three people in the afternoon. Um, something we figured out very quickly with the first three participants is that they all thought that the system had crashed at some point uh, because it was loading and loading and loading uh, due to the fact like how our packaging manager worked and we also used the wrong kind of UI there we found out later. So we used a little spinner in the UI while the page was loading and it was loading for, you know, 30 seconds, one minute and it kept going and going and, and the people that are crying, they were saying, oh, it crashed, I guess, because nothing is happening. But it wasn't. It was running, it was just waiting for the thing to show up. Um, so what, the, what we did over lunch in our development team is that we fixed it. We, we uh, did some stuff with the caching and then we also change it from a spinner to a progress bar, showing more of the indication. Um, because then the people who, who were supposed to test it in the afternoon, they didn't have to uh, go through this again, an issue we already knew was there. If we had done scientific research for, you know, if we wanted to figure out how does a black hole work or um, what's the laws of physics, then we wouldn't have been allowed to do that. You can't change it half through. But when I use a test, you can. Um, because you're only trying to uh, make software better. You're not trying to uh, uncover a, a truth. <laughs> All right. So the second worry that people tend to have is that you um, will need uh, a thousand. You need to run like a, with a thousand participants to make it uh, statistically significant. Um, which you really don't. Um, all right, say, because there are some uh, practical implications of that. All right, so you want your entire team to uh, observe these things, right? And then you decide, oh, I want to run uh, a test with 100 participants. And then you, you do one hour 
per participant. And then you end up with 100, hour, 100 hours, which is like 2.5 work weeks that your entire team needs to sit through. All right, what if we cut that by 10? What if we did only 10 participants? That would then be 100 participants, and it would be 10 hours of material, which is like a little more than a work day, uh, which is fine. So this is actually a graph by uh, Jacob Nielsen. He's a well-known uh, usability guy. Um, they figured out that most of the problems they actually found very early in the process, and the more people they tested with, they kept running into the same things over and over and over again. Um, so, let's see. Already with five people, we uh, reach like, you find 80% of the issues. With 10 people, um, you find close to, you know, 90% of the issues, and then it flattens out after that. Uh, at like person number 25, maybe you find some little issue again, or you know, like, and then, and, but then you're gonna run into the same things over and over and over again. So, uh, you can actually do it with five participants. Maybe you, you, you decrease the scope of the test a little bit, and you get only 30 minutes per participant, and you have 2.5 hours. And that's like, you know, you can gather your whole team before lunch, one day a week, and everything, everyone observes it, and everyone uh, learns from these mistakes. Um, and, and they get to know their, their user base better, and they, they get to know the software, because the development team always have the um, disadvantage that they know too much about how the software works under the hood, which someone who uses the software doesn't know, right? So you're always at the disadvantage, and this kind of testing is supposed to be helpful with that. So, if you then have test 10 participants, you can test two different things. And if you have 100 participants, you can test 20 different things. You could either be testing the same thing, you know, like one day before lunch, and then you fix it until the next week, and then you test the same thing again. And you find some new issues, and you fix those, and by the third week, you have like radically improved software. Or you test different uh, aspects of your software one week, um, and it's not a big investment for a team. And then you're able to, you know, you get an idea, you build something, you test that, uh, based on that test, you get more ideas, and then you build and you test, and like this entire cycle. Alright, so who do you test with? Is it like anyone? Well, it depends a little bit on the uh, scope and audience of your, uh, of your uh, target audience. So, this is for our product. Um, our main audience is junior citizens. Uh, and, and when we test with those, we get the best data. Um, and then non-Linux sysadmins, you know, people who maybe they've been, uh, their sysadmins coming from other platforms, we get great data from them as well. Uh, maybe not as good as like the junior sysadmins. And then software developers, you know, people who, who mainly do software development, uh, they actually end up doing some system administration because they're setting up their test servers, but they don't do it as often. Uh, they are still great, uh, but they don't, you know, it's like a decreasing um, scale. And then like medical doctors, lawyers, and taxi drivers, they can get kind of shit at data, right? Even worse if you test with, if we would test with children, uh, people never used a computer before, or people who can't read. Uh, and even worse data if we test the courses and dogs, and then like cats and, and, and ghosts are, uh, yeah, you would just get shitty data, the cat would run away, right? Um, but for another product, say it's a, a medical application, uh, you would get the best data out of uh, a doctor, and then an increasing CL there, you get pretty good data, but not as great out of a nurse or a hospital administrators. But then you would get really bad data if you test it with a junior sysadmin or a software developer. 
Okay, and when do you run these tests then? So here's a here's like a whole timeline of a project, right? You have the idea, you have the sketch, a wireframe, a prototype, I get branch, beta, and production. Obviously here is too early because you don't have anything to test with. And here is too late because then you have it in running in production, and then someone will press the wrong button and you get a, 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 a you know a panic over the island of uh, Hawaii. But anywhere else well, over this this course, you can do it. If you have a sketch on paper, you can sit down and you can test that with someone, and you would say like, well, what would you do in this scenario in the sketch that I show you? And you you would be able to identify an issue very, very early, even before you do any kind of programming or any kind of things there. When you're a prototype, you get some ideas as well, you know, and, and, and beta, but you know, like it gets harder and harder the further in the process you get. All right, so how do you actually, actually do it? So first you need to identify your unknowns. What is it that I'm unsure about how it will work in this piece of software? What is, what is it that I don't know if my users know? Or what, what do I don't know if it's hard to use or not? So you write those down. Um, and then you take a laptop, install your software on that laptop. Um, you can then start a video meeting. And you can invite your entire development team. You uh, invite the, uh, you put the participant in front of the computer. Or, if you're in your office and they are in their office, uh, which is a nice and, and natural environment, compared to going to Oracle and sitting in a weird room, uh, it's a kind of lab. Um, Alright, so we have three kind of people that are, we have the moderator, some people call this this facilitator also, but it's a person that will moderate the entire test. And then we have the participant, the person who want to uh, help test the software. And you're not testing the person, and this is critical. And you need to tell them also, we're not testing you, we're testing the software. So don't be afraid of doing it wrong. And then you have the entire team joining as well. All right, and the moderator should have their audio and video on. The participant should have their audio and video on, and then they share their desktop. Uh, and then the rest of the team needs to be silent, needs to be invisible. Because it's very frustrating if you develop the piece of software and then you're putting someone in front of it and it doesn't work quite the thing. So you need to resist the urge to scream, why don't you see it's right there, the button, right? So that's why you need to uh, keep them silent. All right. And during the test itself, the moderator um, uh, has a script, right? And the script could be things you want to find out. Um, let me see if I can find that out here. Yeah, it, with, with tasks. So it's like, please update the operating system. Uh, what is the status of the firewall? And please grow this storage volume. These are things we tested out uh, on network. So this is the kind of things that the moderator goes through this uh, uh, script and ask these questions, right? And ask the participant to carry it out. And uh, it's very important that the moderator do not help like the first thing, because it's very easy for the, the participant to be asking for help. Well, where is this thing? How do I do this? How does this work? And then the moderator should return the question and say, well, how do you think it works? What would you expect here? And the team should be listening, taking notes, and not talking. All right, and then you carry through the thing for 30 minutes. You record the whole thing. You write up the findings. Um, if you publish it anywhere, you need to respect the participants' um, privacy. Uh, because even though you know, you're testing the software, it's never fun to have your name attached to a report that says, oh, this person couldn't quite uh, use this piece of software because, you know, it's so easy to blame the end user for people to blame themselves. Oh, they couldn't use it because they were too dumb. While in reality, it was the uh, software that was badly designed. And then you fix the issues. And then you go over the cycle again. You test the new uh, uh, interface with uh, the fixed version. 
You build it, you test it, new ideas, you build it and then test it. And that's it. Thank you. So should you reuse the testers as the, the what do you call them, persons who te uh, do the test or? Oh, if you reuse the participants. So what we have done in our project is once someone has tested one version of, you know, a certain aspect of the software, they're kind of burned on that aspect because then they only learn it, right? You don't get the first experience and you carry over knowledge from the previous version that you tested. So I think it's it's fine to reuse the same persons, but don't test the same thing once again. Uh, have them test something completely different. I was th thinking those different phases in, in software project, like uh, sketch and, and uh, and yeah, uh, prototypes and, and, and so on. Is there kind of a checklist or guidelines that which kind of aspects you should try to focus in each one of those areas? Because definitely on, on, on sketch phase you, you have to stay on a really low level and, and then a little bit up so that you get the best possible kind of value out. Yeah, I think on the, on the sketch phase you get an idea of, you know, you, you get an idea of, of a general layout or something, you, you realize if, if the wording you're using is correct, um, and with a, but it is very low level, right? I mean, it's, it's early and it's cheap because you can throw it again and test, you know, just draw something up and test it again. Um, and then on, um, say, the prototype level where you have shitty code that you hooked up to false data or like a you know, weird database that is not actually the database, um, you, you get more um, low fidelity of things with it, right? You get people's impression of color and you get the impression of, you know, does this look like it's professional enough and things like that. And then, you know, like on the Git branch, you get like quite good value out of it, but it's also very expensive at a point, right? Because you put a lot of development effort into it. Um, so to some extent, you get better results. And of course, in production, you're dealing uh, with the exact data that people would actually use. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's filled out and properly, but then it's also too late because, you know, then it's in production. Does that make sense? Yes. Anyone else? Everyone's happy. Thank you. Thank you.